right, thank you. Um, so my name's Sime, and I'm excited to be here to tell you all a little bit about a project that actually had its genesis here at UW when I was a postdoc a few years ago, just before starting my own lab. And um, I guess when you go on the job market and you're a brand new faculty, you kind of forget that there's a really important part of making science happen, which is human beings. So there's a little bit of a lull in this and we finally found the right people to do it and it's picking back up. So I'm excited to share with like Leah and Doug who were there for the beginning. Um, so uh, one of the things that my lab is really interested in is understanding exactly how bacteria respond to the microbes that are around them. And so we started looking at some of the toxins that are exchanged between competing bacteria. So I'd like to do first is tell you a little bit about the system that we're working with and some of the really big questions that we found difficult to answer using our traditional methods and why deep mutational scanning was such an attractive approach. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what we found and some surprising things that have led us into a number of um, cool directions that we didn't expect. So um, most bacteria actually exist within these microbial communities where they have neighbors that they have to compete and respond to. And the system that we were really interested in at the time was this system called type six secretion system, which is in gram negative bacteria. And it mediates this contact dependent antagonism between neighboring cells. So what that means is that these cells are able to inject antibacterial toxins directly into their neighbors as a means for competition. And so the Toxin that we we're particularly interested in was this one that upon injection into the recipient cell, what it does is it gets delivered into this space where the cell wall of the bacteria is and it degrades the peptidoglycan layer that's there through hydrolysis. And that in turn causes cells to experience osmotic stress and then they die through lysis. And so this toxin is called um, type six secretion amidase effector, TA1. And the one we started with was from Pseudomonas aeruginosa because that was the bacterium we were working with at the time. And so this particular toxin, although there's a cocktail of different toxins delivered, this one toxin accounts for sometimes up to 90% of license of the recipient cells. Meaning if you delete that single toxin, 90% of that competitive advantage goes away. And so there's a bit of a range here, and that's actually important because that was one of the reasons we were interested in thinking about this toxin, which is that it really depends on the bacterial species that this toxin gets delivered to, how potent it is. And that's cool for us because we know that cell wall, which is the actual substrate of this toxin, varies in composition and structural organization across different species. So we guess that maybe one of the contributing factors could be the specificity of the toxin or its ability to interact with these different cell wall types. Oops, sorry. So what we wanted to think about was, could we actually engineer these toxins to do the outcome that we really wanted by knowing something about how it's able to sample these different types of cell walls? The problem was that we don't know that much still even today, even though we know a lot about cell walls, you think that we know everything about how proteins recognize the structure, but we actually still don't know a lot. And that has to do with the way the substrate is presented inside of a cell. And so um, we tried to use crystallography, which was my background in graduate school, to co-crystallize it with a piece of the cell wall. And really, we just weren't able to actually dock much of the peptidoglycan fragment from the cell wall into this. Um, and I'm going to explain to you why I think that may be just from a biochemical and structural perspective. So the cell wall is actually a, an incredible contiguous three-dimensional structure. So within the bacterium, the cell wall uh, for the gram-negative bacteria sits just within the outer membrane. And these red loops that I've drawn are these glycan strands that run approximately circumferential to the cell. And so these are then connected by peptides, which are themselves cross-linked to each other. So what you actually have is a single contiguous molecule, not these discrete soluble fragments that would be more amenable to biochemical or structural approaches. So that's both problematic, but also really interesting because it pulls us into a whole different way of thinking about how proteins and enzymes interact with their substrates, which for many other substrates in the cell are not these perfectly soluble things. We have membranes, we have cell walls, and they take on different states and they're highly heterogeneous. And so it's also solid. And so if you boil everything away from the cell using SDS and um, heat, you're left with these, what we call sacculi, because there are these uh, peptidoglycan sacs. And so you can see here in the microscopy that they're really intact. 
they provide both structure but also shape to the cells. And so I had mentioned earlier that the composition of the cell walls vary between different species. So here on the left, what you can see is I've drawn these glycans and these peptides, and there's a lot of different features about them that can vary. I'll just tell you a few of the examples. Um, the peptide chain lengths, as well as the glycan chain lengths, can vary. The degree of cross-linking, the types of residues that are in those peptides, as well as a number of different chemical modifications to all those different components, the types of cross-links there are. And that can both vary across different species, but also even within the same cell, whether it's in stationary or log phase, we know that these are things that are modulated by the cell for some reasons that we understand and many that we actually don't. Um, and so trying to understand structurally how these are recognized by different proteins and then be able to go in there and tinker with that in competitions means that we really need a better model of how this happens in vivo. And that was really where the deep mutational scanning came in because that might give us a different way of looking at it that really takes us into the cell and samples exactly what the interaction looks like in vivo. And so at the beginning of this project, we also tried some NMR, which I wanted to mention. Peter Brodit is here from Rachel um, and Rachel Clevitt's group that we worked closely with. Um, we tried to start expanding out, um, looking at larger and larger fragments of PG with the proteins, looking at the shifts, and it made us even more excited about doing DMS because what we saw is that the residues that had the greatest intensity of shifts were distributed all over the protein, both near the active site here in the middle, but also around to the back side which had us scratching our heads a little bit because we couldn't quite figure out why there would be so many physical interactions in the back if they really were direct interactions. Um, but one thing we thought just sort of a priori is that maybe because of this mesh-like layer that maybe it's actually sitting in there in a way that we hadn't imagined before, that there could be some uh, backside interactions that are important for placing it in the right place in this lattice. And so we decided to move forward with the deep mutational scan um, the first question being whether these distal sites actually matter when we scan the entire protein. And so this is a lot of the work of a postdoc in my lab, Dr. Tanis Radkoff. Um, and we decided to take advantage of a pretty easy assay that we can do in E. coli, which is that you can overexpress the enzyme alone, take it away from the secretion system that it's normally um, delivered through, and we overexpress it in the periplasm. We see that wild type causes the cells to lyse upon induction, and then the catalytic mutant and the empty vector do not. And so this is a nice, easy assay for us to just simply express the protein, induce with IPDG, and look at things that die and things that don't die. And so doing that, we introduce the library into E. coli, and then we can read out for activity. Activity, in this case, being the opposite of what you normally think about, which is that when cells die, the toxin is active because it's lysing the cells. Um, so the coloring scheme is a little bit opposite, um, where the gain of function mutants, things that are more active than wild type, are going to look blue because they are causing more death in the population. Wild type I'm going to show you as neutral, and then enriched will be loss of function because the cells are now surviving. And that could be for a number of reasons, um, ranging from loss of interaction with the PG to maybe instability or uh, poor expression. Um, okay, so here is the result of three individual scans that we did. Um, let me orient you here. We're peering directly into the active site with the catalytic cysteine and the catalytic histidine. So you can already see that binding cleft where we imagine PG may go. And if we take a look, just take a walk around the protein, see that mostly there's a little bit of pink running around the enzyme, meaning those are the loss of function sites. But Really, the main uh, loss function that we see was in the middle of the catalytic center. And then also, you can't see in this right here, but the hydrophobic core of the protein. And so we decided to take a look at it a slightly different way with Tanya Cortemi's lab. They were starting to cluster the different types of mutations into discrete color bins. And so now I've colored if that particular single, sub or single site any substitution you give it primarily leads to loss of function. We color red, the opposite for gain of function, and then we have mixed zones, which are purple, where it really depends on what residue we introduce. And so what you can see here in this case is this almost like ring of red that runs around the enzyme. And so we think of that as the no touch zone. There's something really unique about that ring of interactions or residues that's important for the function of the enzyme. And I'll say a number of those do overlap well with the ones that we saw by NMR. 
So what we're thinking, and I'm not going to focus on this too much today because I want to actually jump to the gain of functions. We think that that ring resembles some really critical physical interactions that may be happening with the peptidyl glycan. And some of the purple, it's flexible. It can maybe modulate some of the specificity or the degree of the um, catalytic rate. We're not quite sure all of the reasons why that is yet, but we're pretty excited about the equator and trying to look at maybe in the future exactly how this enzyme moves along the substrate. Maybe that could give us a clue as to why it might need those interactions in the back. Okay. So um, what I want to pivot to is what about the gain of function variance? Uh, so like with any project, it's always those things that you're not really looking for that are the most interesting. We weren't actually expecting to find a lot of gain of function because we thought these are toxins. They've evolved to be as toxic as possible. So it's probably not, not a lot of space there for improvement. And so we took a look at our uh, data and there's actually quite a few gain of function mutants. And here what I'm showing are top three that we can go back out and validate one at a time. Um, and one thing I'll just mention that was really interesting is that our top 10 gain of function mutants, these are toxins that are performing even better than wild type, were all single amino acid substitutions. We're kind of expecting that in our data set, maybe one of the reasons we don't see those is you need multiple changes in order to lead to some improvements. So it definitely begs the question why these mutations don't already exist or these variants don't already exist in nature, which I'll come back to. Um, but anyhow, we found three, um, S144P and F78Y are surface proteins or surface residues, and then C110S is a partially buried residue near the active site. And so I'll just say that we did have to go through a number of the different gain of function mutants and make sure it wasn't just increase in protein expression that was leading to this. And so we ruled out S144P because of that, but the two others we decided to move on with. And I'm going to tell you a little more about C110S today. Okay, so the three questions what we thought could be fun to go after is number one, more mechanistic in nature. Why is this variant more lytic than wild type? Can we get some insight into how the the enzyme actually moves or functions that would explain this. Um, number two, could we take advantage of this? Would it actually lead to greater killing in a bacterial competition if we reintroduce it to Pseudomonas? Could we actually force more E. coli to die in a competition? And then the other question that I alluded to, which is why doesn't it already exist in nature? Okay, so um, I just want to show you here on the structure of uh, TA1 where this C110S is. It's in yellow back here. Um, and you can see it's just behind the catalytic cysteine and histidine in red. And it's not in a disulfide bond. It's just sitting right behind the active site there. And so for, so for some reason, uh, changing this to a serine and only a serine is what leads to the gain of function. So we tested all the other amino acid substitutions to make sure we didn't miss anything there. Um, so we saw the structure of this enzyme, uh, and what we found is, you know, there's a subtle difference in, you know, the, the positioning of the histidine, although we don't know um, if that's always the confirmation it takes, but what we do see in the structure is that there's slight differences in the actocyte architecture. So you can see here that there's a deepening of this pocket right near the active site, um, and some changes sort of peripheral to the active site cleft. And so one of the things we're following up on now is whether maybe this could change the specificity of the enzyme. There's a lot of different peptidyl glycan fragments that this enzyme can hydrolyze. Um, we're interested in whether it might constrain or expand the types of peptidyl glycan fragments it can cut, or maybe the relative rates against these different species could have some effect of where it goes in the cell because they're um, distributed non-uniformly in the cell. Um, and then the other observation we made is that here on the wild type, you can see what happens when we overexpress this enzyme. Um, in wild type, the cells start to round and eventually they burst. When we do the same thing on the right with C110S, we actually notice that the cells kind of elongate a little bit before they pop. And so there's a different cellular phenotype going on that we don't fully understand, um, but it indicates that maybe the, the mechanism of action at a cellular level is a little bit different. And I think this actually is going to be the more interesting direction because I, I didn't want to show you a bunch of negative data, but we tested activity in vitro of, you know, mole of enzyme against mole of enzyme. And basically C110S behaves exactly like wild type in every assay we throw at it. So it doesn't seem that its intrinsic catalytic rate has changed, but something about the way it's interacting with the, the cell has changed. 
Um, and so here's the, the cell lengths quantified. Um, it's kind of making us think about when in the cell cycle it's acting or maybe even slightly slower rate could cause more elongation before lysing. We're not really sure at this point. So we're starting to um, think more about that and do some more cellular assays. Um, but I wanna move on to whether or not you know, this leads to greater killing. Cause I guess in the end, um, regardless of what the mechanism is, this would be a really cool outcome if we could actually engineer um, bacterial competitions. And so we introduced it into uh, Pseudomonas and we did competitions against between Pseudomonas and E. coli. And so what I'm showing you here is what we refer to as a competitive index. We'll take different strains of Pseudomonas and compete with E. coli, mix them at a one-to-one -one ratio. And then we'll use a cell counter through um, cell sorting, different fluorescence to actually count the ratio of the cells coming out. And so um, right here on the very left, delta L ICMF is when we basically knock out type six completely. So this is our negative control. And then we have the wild type and the catalytic mutant of this enzyme. And so what you can see is that having the wild type enzyme there gives it a significant competitive advantage against E. coli. So the higher the bar is, the better it's doing against the target cell, which is E. coli. So the first one we did was we looked at Pseudomonas stationary cells against E. coli stationary cells. This is kind of just a historical thing in the field where people tend to use stationary phase cells in these competitions. So in this case, we didn't see a significant difference between C110S or TA1 wild type. We did the controls of making sure it was expressed, making sure it got into the recipient cell and was actually secreted, and all those things checked out. Um, interestingly, when we took Pseudomonas in log phase, we did see a significant difference in the competitive index, which had us kind of scratching our heads as to what was actually different about these contexts that would make that be the case. Um, and I'll jump to the punchline, which is we, think that it has to do with the way Pseudomonas may accidentally be killing itself. That in these conditions, we actually see that Pseudomonas, the fitness of Pseudomonas cells is worse for the C110S than in the actual log phase cells. And I'll explain why I think that is, but I have to explain this first, because I think the two may actually be related. Um, so what kept bugging us throughout all this is why doesn't C110S already exist? And one thing I haven't told you yet is that pseudomonas cells can actually target other pseudomonas cells with the toxin. But there's actually an antitoxin there, an immunity protein that's cognate for each of the different toxins that's delivered. It's called TAI1 for TA1 immunity protein 1. And so the way that pseudomonas prevents itself from accidentally killing sister cells is by having the antidote that can bind and inhibit this toxin. And so we thought maybe this could be one of the constraints that would prevent certain mutations from existing in the population because it can't be so good that it escapes its own immune protection. And so, oops, sorry, I don't know why that's so low res. Um, this is a structure of uh, the TA1 with the TAI1 protein bound. And what you can see is that it's binding next to the active site center and C110S is over here. And if you recall, there are some changes in that area. And so, what we did is we did ITC using um, the immunity protein with the two different types. And we did see, in fact, that um, the C110S seems to bind at a much lower affinity. So what we think is happening is that it's allowing the toxin to escape or outperform the immunity protein and then lead to self-intoxication. OK, so my time's up, so I'm going to go really quickly actually into the future directions. Um, we think that there could be a lot of promise here for both understanding the biology of the cell, but also engineering these interbacterial competitions. So we're doing some comparative transcriptomics for the intoxicated cells to see if we can identify different pathways that are turned on in response to the wild type versus the variant. Um, lo localization about chemical analysis of these enzymes. Um, and then we're also introducing more TAI1 into the pseudomonas strain to see if we can overcome by titrating in more of the immunity protein. And we're also looking at the other hyperactive candidates and kind of taking um, uh, this strategy of now we're looking at the scan in different bacterial recipient cells that maybe we will actually get a different picture on the surface of the protein, different hyperactive mutants, depending on where we screen. So we were to look in different bacterial species or you know, stationary phase or genetic backgrounds that we could potentially use these as probes to go in and kind of sample the cell environment and tell us how to re-engineer re the enzyme for the outcome that we want. So um, 
I want to wrap up by saying thank you to everyone, especially to the people at UW, because it was so instrumental in getting this going, and it's kind of a fun direction in the lab. Um, I mentioned a few of the people here that helped my lab, uh, Atanas Radkoff, who was the lead on this project, and in my funding sources. Thank you. Thank you.